Hey everyone, I am just about to go live with three incredible people um, and I just want to wait for everyone to join. We are going to be um, celebrating Latin American Climate Week. So it's just so great to see everyone. I hope you all have been doing well. I have missed being able to have these conversations. I've, um, I'm a student, so I have been studying for final exams. I don't know how many of you are in that position right now, but uh, it has been definitely a journey. I would love to know how everyone is, what have you been doing, how are you spending your time, and then of course, where you're joining from, because today is going to be a pretty kind of global um, conversation, it always is, with a regional focus, so I'm really excited um, to have our guests join us. I hope that they're all here. Um, essentially, we want to celebrate what is happening this week. There's so many discussions on Latin America and the Caribbean, what is needed. Oh, I love it. People from Argentina. So nice to have you. Um, and I think it's really important for us to be able to understand what is happening. How can we support like our fellow young people who are advocating in these regions? And um, yeah, that's essentially what we want to have today. I'm going to see IG has changed things around how I, yes, bring on the Connect for Climate. Ooh, youth live series. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. So great to see everyone. I don't know if you guys have been introduced into this four square feature, but this is new on Instagram, so we can finally have these conversations. Um, so what I would love to do, we've got more people joining. Um, I sh guess I should now formally introduce myself. Hi, everyone. I'm Selena Abraham. I've been a co-host for the Youth for Climate live series. Um, we've been having, you know, monthly discussions um, since middle of, I think, about last year, um, leading up to COP26, leading up to um, the pre-COP26 event in Milan and really just trying to get young people together to talk about climate action, the different facets of it, um, and so many ways that we can all get involved. So I'm just very grateful to have you all here. I think um, just to get everyone right, like who's who and in which square we all are in, it would be great if you could um, introduce yourselves and what you're doing, where you are, your work. Um, so maybe starting off with Azul. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for having us here. Um, I'm Azul. I am a um, research and policy coordinator in Echo House. And with Sustentabilidad Sin Fronteras, we are the regional coordination of this year's uh, regional COI for Latin America and the Caribbean. So we're very excited about kickstarting this process uh, for this year. That's amazing. Thank you so much for being here and for the work you're doing. I'm sure it's a busy week. Um, and then I think we have Nasha. Yes, good morning everyone. So my name is Nasha and as you as say, uh, we are coordinating the regional conference of youth for this year for Latin America and the Caribbean. I am from Sustainability Sin Fronteras, so it's an organization that works with Echo House as a regional organization for this year. And we're very, very excited about this uh, event, a series of events, because we think it's important to have youth together. Perfect. And last but not least, uh, the man in the room, Axel. Hey, hello. Uh, I'm a joint manager from the Sultras of, of Mexico. Uh, right now, I'm working with two good projects. And one of these is the Latin American Student Energy Summit that we will launch from the 18th to the 1st of, of October this year. Uh, I'm, I'm leading a discarbonization plan for a thermal, thermal electric plant that is burning for low to generate electricity here in Mexico. So thanks so much for the invite. Lovely. I love the like diversity of, of work and skills and places that you're all in. Um, and just to get to know, I mean, we've got so many people online already. Um, I would love to know how many of you are from Latin America and the Caribbean, how many of you are joining from uh, outside of the region, because I think it helps us also contextualize this conversation. And um, if you have any questions for the people in the audience as, or, or the participants as we go along, send them in the chat. I will um, definitely bring them up so we can talk about it. 
Um, so first off, I guess to, to really just align to the moment and the week, um, I would love to hear from you all individually why you think Climate Week, and especially this Latin America and Caribbean Climate Week is happening, is so important to the climate agenda. Um, and also, why is it important for, you know, everyone joining today? So perhaps we'll kick it off with Axel. Yes, of course. Um, well, right now, um, I think that we're facing the collapse of the, of the education system. The 90% of the students around the world stop going to school. Um, of course, this affects because and we know that in lack countries, the front, frontiers are bigger and difficult for this type of, um, I don't know, like problems that we face right now. And that's the reason why we need a more democratic education system for all. And we have to focus in this effort, this effort on the critical use of technology, and empowering, for example, young people to create their own content and follow real experts that show the way that we have to to improve our skills. Um, that's the reason that we uh, we are implementing a solution for this in the energy education platform that I'm developing with different chapters from student energy uh, programs uh, in the region. Uh, this e-learning platform will be open for more than 10,000 young energy leaders from 42 countries of this of this region. And we know that we, we have to use the technology that we have and improve the knowledge to the next education level. So in this part, uh, and all the, uh, I don't know, like uh, situations in which the the pandemic putting on all the young activists right now. Uh, we want to uh, like wake up different sense of the human because we're very, very uh, like, I don't know, like full on the uh, seeing or the listen, but we, we can touch right now because we are like very, very far away. And what this is one of the points that we want to implement in the platform now that we can use the technology like virtual uh, technologies or augmented reality technologies to generate like a more interactive uh, knowledge around this. So I think this is one of the things that I want to share with you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think it's really important to touch on like the moment right now and um... You know, I don't know. I don't know if we think or talk about it enough, just how young people, I mean, pre-pandemic, there was such a, an energy and a momentum and this buildup of real physical presence. And, and um, I feel like, you know, we were organizing, we were uniting, we were um, feeling so excited and motivated about what we could do and how we could push our governments, et cetera, to act. Um, and it, things have shifted. And I think it's it's so important in this moment. And as you know, even Climate Week talks about the unique impact of the pandemic and how that's going to shape every country's, you know, trajectory moving forward. Um, that we also think and talk about how it influences our trajectory too, and what does our youth activism look like? So it's so nice um, to hear that you're actively working on it and um, and finding innovative ways to do that. Um, I guess I'd move to Nasha. Why do you think it's important? Why is this this particular regional week important to the climate agenda? Sure. So I believe uh, it's very important that we are aware that we are in the decisive decade, right? We have nine years to cut off emissions by half, and this may be the priority for the global north, but as global south and from youth, we have to be sure that our governments follow an agenda that really uh, has to do with protecting the most vulnerable and having adaptation policies and many other things that sometimes in these global discussions are not taken away. So if we talk about green recovery and how our countries are going to cope with this crisis, we need to be sure that our governments are following the right path. And the right path is the one that doesn't take the future of the next generations and the youth right now from us. So, um, this is why I believe a week like this one is very important so Latin America as a region can express their needs and their priorities and to focus to understand what do we need to get where we want to be, right? And to set goals and be very vigilant from civil society and from youth organizations to be sure that they are taking in account all the elements that are needed 
to be in the right path of following uh, development and green recovery. So this is the reason I believe a week like this is very important and to have you being aware of the processes that are going on uh, and the road to COP. That's why um, we also believe in the regional COI, right? Because it's somehow a way to show that activism is possible for youth, even in times of pandemic, with um, being connected like this by uh, all the digital media that we can and to gather the strength to really push our governments. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much. I, I'm glad you brought up the regional COI because I think, um, I, I mean, Let's let's see how many people actually know what that means, but I think I can hand it over to um, Azul to talk about it, uh, the power of, of kind of perhaps where the, the COI sits in alignment with the agenda of um, Climate Week as a whole, um, and also a bit of your experience organizing it. So what what are you experiencing right now? Okay, that's that's a very interesting question. So for those of you who don't know, COI, it's, it stands for Conference of Youth, and it's the official channel which youth from all over the world can um, elevate their, their demands, their thoughts, their ideas to the formal UNFCCC process. COI is organized by YANGO, which is the um, formal um, youth constituency within the framework of UNFCCC and uh, local organizations from the country which is being hosted. This year, of course, COI will be hosted in Glasgow as will COP as well. But then, as a way to include everyone's voices and understanding that not everyone can travel to Glasgow, to Madrid, to wherever COP is being held, uh, from 2011, local COIs have been happening all over the world, which are local chapters that happened before the global COI, let's say, and feed into that process. So in that regard, and this, this is something that we have been dreaming on for years, but I think it was crystallized in 2019 when we went to COP. A lot of uh, Latin American and the Caribbean um, activists, youth activists, gathered there and we wanted to do something together to generate momentum for our region, understanding that our region will be one of the most affected, is one of the most affected by climate change, and is one of the regions that uh, least contributed to this problem. Uh, we wanted to have a united voice and to do something, but we figured it out in COP. So there we saw the need of a regional process, a process that's serious, that's long, that is open to everyone, that, that is inclusive uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean within the framework of UNFCCC and, of course, within the framework of what already exists. So building from what's already been built, which is the whole governance of COI and local COIs. So in this regard, this year, and with experience that um, Echo House and both Sustentabilidad Sin Fronteras have on these topics, we thought, hey, why not catalyze all of what we've been doing and organize a regional conference of the youth for our region? And in this regard, we understand that we cannot think or organize this whole conference and this, this um, and, and to connect all of the youth voices from a region that we want on our own. And this is where our national coordinations enter. That, that selection process was closed last week and we've announced them yesterday. So we are going to work in alliance with over 40 organizations from all over the region to try to bring as many youth voices from Latin America and the Caribbean to the regional COI, but then of course, to Global COI, to PRECOP and also to COP so that Latin American and Caribbean youth voices are each year more and more uh, heard. That's, that's the, the bottom objective of, of our COI, is that the voices from our region are heard. And I think so I, it's perfectly into what Black Climate Week means and, and what the momentum that it's trying to generate. We, the momentum, we were all waiting for 2020 to happen and it was like this huge momentum building up and then with the pandemic, it all came crashing down. So I think um, we're putting all our efforts and all our energy in 2021, having that momentum for climate ambition all over the world, but specifically in our region. Yeah, I, I um, every time I hear about COIS, like, I, I don't know, it makes me really happy because it's my first, I think it's the first kind of big climate event I attended. Um, and it was so overwhelming because there's so many people and there were so many things. It was, uh, I think, in Paris at the time. And um 
you know, I think sometimes we as as young people can fall into our little bubble uh, of like the young people we're working with and the, you know, whether it's you're working on a local issue or, uh, you know, working on energy, Axel. And so you kind of get in your group. And I've always was, I love Koi because it allows you this opportunity to step back and, and connect with so many other pieces of the puzzle. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I think it's one of the most important things to do is main, make sure that young people know how the puzzle comes together with climate and how to connect with each other. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear from you all. Um, just in the past year or so, is there a particular like lesson that you learned that you feel like has changed your thinking a bit on um, how you think youth should organize in the future? Uh, perhaps what the Latin America youth voice should look like is, you know, it's been a, an interesting year and I think I'm trying to have myself also reflect on what I've learned and um, how things have changed. So I don't know, it's a bit of a big question, but I think it would be nice to hear your reflections on this. Um, Axel, I don't know if you have uh, an answer or a thought. I, I can't hear you, I don't know if you're muted. I'm sorry. Can you hear me right now? Oh, okay, yeah. okay, sorry. I think I can hear the the question that you're saying. I'm just wondering if there's one lesson um, that you've learned over the past like year and a half, two years. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see you raising your hand. All right, maybe if we get started, we'll we'll see. Nasha. <laughs> so I believe that the pandemic was something that none of us expected to happen. Even if there was scientific information, it might be possible that something like this happened. It was a real shock for everyone, everywhere around the world. And this really opened the eyes for everyone to say, hey, if scientists are saying that this is going to happen and they have much more information and more accurate information that climate change impacts are going to be like this, why are we not paying the necessary attention and acting like if we had that information? We know that if we could prevent something like a pandemic, the benefits for all, for our health, for our economies, for our people, for our societies would be greater. So why are we not taking uh, all the necessary steps and actions to prevent things happening from climate change? So that was a great um, wake up opening for me. In a personal level, I even decided to change my job. I decided to quit my, my job I was having as a sustainable manager in a company. And I decided to take in my full time to something like Sustentabilidad Sin Fronteras, which is an organization that was born um, with our participation with some fellows in the COPS. It, the, the, the COI in Paris, I was there too, and it was overwhelming. It was amazing. Um, being there uh, is an experience that says to you, yes, we can do this. This is definitely what should be happening. I love to see people using um, so many people with these great ideas together. Mm -hmm. that, like You have the feeling that actually a better world is possible. So that is why I believe some of this needs to be... We need to bring some of these feelings to the air goi and the momentum from the climate week and to stay really united as a youth, be believing, being a stubborn optimist, as like Christina Figueres said, that we can change the world because it's the, the only mindset that's going to help us right now. I love that. Uh, yeah, so this is, I like to focus on bringing kind of the hope back because I think we had that uh, before and it can it can feel hard when you're not connected to people to be still inspired and i think that's been really the point of not just this conversation with the youth for climate series as a whole is to keep that that inspiration that energy community going um yeah so the question was on just any lessons kind of post is it it's not even post pandemic like during pandemic i guess uh that you've learned that has maybe changed your thinking on um how you organize your work um, what you think we should be doing moving forward? Either Axel, okay. if you yeah. have one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Um, well, something that the pandemic really teached to me is around resilience, because to be resilient right now is 
very important. Um, of course, the planning of the Latin American Student Energy Summit starts in like two years ago. So when we start to plan uh, the pandemic, it, it was not uh, there. So every plan that we start uh, was thinking on, you know, like connect with people in, in a city, you know, like uh, try to to uh, take a plane and start to, you know, like get into this summit and, and connect with more people in person. But um, when we we start to think around what what uh, options we have with the pandemic, of course, uh, we have to be wrestling. We had to be wrestling in that moment uh, because everyone in the people even no, didn't know when, what about the machine, for, for example, no. The machine was a moment that is happening this year, but the last year, everyone is like, oh, what is going to happen around this? So, <laughs> you know, like a sponsorship, for example, was very difficult for us because who wants to, uh, uh, you know, like give some a sponsor to a uh, summit that it, it doesn't work right now? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> that every moment in, in, the, in the past around the creation of this event, uh, I, I think this was to be planned because um, right now the decision what we take, what we took in that moment was to improve in technology and technology was like the solution for us because uh, is the democratical part of the of the connectivity that we, we, we can generate right now because we live in, in a society in which every day and every moment uh, we are in social media, we are uh, creating content, we are learning our, around different contents and everything is in, in one dispositive right now. So what about the critical use of the technology that we are implementing right now? No? Uh, we, we can spend like, um, uh, one day for our life, uh, seeing uh, Peaky Blinders all the all the seasons in one day. But what about uh, if we can implement this this time and this critical use of the technology into an energy uh, management uh, program? You know, like online energy management program. Of course, the people will be get uh, more uh, skills around energy saving, for example. No, so that's the part that we. Uh, um, improve around the creator of this platform because people can uh, use very well the dispositives that what we have right now, but with a new sense of uh, climate education, for example, or energy education, for example. No, and I think that resilience uh, give us this because thinking in resilience uh, is like thinking on. We, we want a more strike one, you know, we, we want a more strike to, to do the things well. So I think it's that the reason that I know. Thank you. I, I feel that because it's been it's been a while and like that. Yeah, it's resilience, but it's, it's also just the kind of this flexibility to adapt as well that we're maybe learning in, in a very harsh. <laughs> it was a pretty drastic way. Um, and yeah, I think no doubt it's had an impact on so many of us. And so I think it's nice to hear um yes there were struggles for sure and like trying to figure out how do we still organize how do we uh connect in, in a moment of crisis but also I, I love your pivot now to thinking about okay well where are the spaces that we're using now what are the tools that can help us get there um and that's part of part of the journey and the innovation process um but i guess last i, I want to hand over to azul what what do you feel like you've learned over the past year Okay, that's a very complicated question. I, I feel the pandemic has clearly showed what we say when we say that climate change will not affect everyone equally. So the pandemic mm -hmm. affect us, affected us all. That's 100% true. But it affected everyone differently. And those that are already vulnerable were the ones affected the most. So, so for instance, me, someone living in a capital city with good connection, with a stable job and so on, I was I can't hear you anymore. Can you hear? No. No. So you were on a roll. I was about to start clapping. 
No, I still can't hear you. Uh, I don't know. Maybe if you drop off and come back on, it might work. Cause... Well, that's something that we learned from this pandemic is yes. that connection means all. Like, <laughs> so uh, taking what Asu was saying, not everyone had internet connection. And that's been a gap for many. Yeah, can can you try? Oh, okay. We got to get our four squares back. Um, but that is something I've been thinking about so much. That if people didn't understand why like climate justice is important before, like there, you have to understand it now. This is, uh, and we're still in the process. I feel like we're still figuring out how to deal with it at a global level. That. I, yeah, figures out or at least rectifies a little bit of the balance. Um, and we'll see with the vaccines whether mm -hmm. that's the case. Okay, there? Can you, Am I back? Yes. Sorry, yeah. I don't know what happened. Sorry. Maybe my connection was lost. Okay, I was, so I was saying, um, for me, the pandemic was a clear um, showcase of what we say when we say that climate change will not affect everyone equally. Some people, I mean, we were all affected by the pandemic. But some people lost their jobs, some people lost their homes, some people even, yeah, died because of COVID, lost uh, close ones and so on. And climate change will act exactly on the same basis. Uh, those people that are already more vulnerable, so marginalized communities and vulnerable communities and, and historically excluded people from our systems will be the ones that are already affected and will be affected the most by climate change. And in our region, that will happen a lot and it's already happened for happening for instance last year the caribbean lived uh one of the biggest and most powerful hurricane seasons ever recorded and as a consequence of that two migrant caravans left honduras uh going to the u.s to because they lost their homes and everything so that this is just a tiny example of what climate mm -hmm. change has in store for us and i think that i hope i don't think i really do hope that the pandemic helped help us clarify this to the, the, our decision makers, to the people that need to raise ambition on climate change policy. Uh, the pandemic has to be a clear example that we do not want to repeat of how uh, something that the, the world as a whole will affect everyone, but will worsen the, the way that most vulnerable communities live and in this sense is that i feel what we're trying to do because we're always trying we're never achieving it what we're trying to yeah. do with our is to bring all the voices at stake or most of the voices at stake something that i also learned last year um, from a very powerful group of young people that i work with was that it is really important for people to be able to speak on by themselves not to have a third proxy speaking for them so we really need to bring all the voices from Latin America and the Caribbean to uh, the ARCOI. And I think that's what we're trying to do with our national coordinations and with this huge network of over 40 organizations. And if you're seeing us, what I can uh, tell you is please do follow us on social media and engage with us, engage with ARCOI, because your voice is really, really important. The, the core of ARCOI is that we are able to speak our own voices and so is everyone in the region. That's, can you can you tell them how they can follow? Because I do, I would love for everyone to, yes. to join. So they can follow us on Instagram, the, where Nasha is just meeting is the Arcoy Instagram account, so at Arcoy Lack. We also have Twitter, and stay tuned to, to our social media and to our partners' social media, and please do follow all our, our national coordinations and all the organizations involved in this process to, to find out about the latest announcements. We will have a road to our COI till September. So we will be doing a lot of events and webinars and we will be having a lot of engagement opportunities for you. And it's really important for, for you to, if you want to get involved, if you, if you want your voice to be heard in the international decision-making process, <laughs> uh, please follow us and please engage with us because really our aim is as simple as bringing your voice to the UN and to the international um, negotiations. Perfect. I, I hope everyone does join because I think um, 
koi's are the best place to get involved. It's like the first step, and after that, you'll find your home and what you want to do and your mission.、Uh, but even if you don't feel like you know a lot about climate, I feel like the koi's are in- incredible for just teaching you so much each year. It doesn't matter how long I feel like you're in this space. I'm always, always, always learning.、Um, and one thing I want to talk about now is like we have,、um, and for those of you who are just joining us, I'm seeing these numbers go up and down. We're we're celebrating and continuing the conversation on、um, Latin America and Caribbean Climate Week, which is this week,、um, and are joined. I'm I'm just here, Salina. I'm just facilitating this conversation. But the true voices that we are trying to spotlight here are Axel and Azul and Nasha.、Um, Who are all organizing in different ways on on the continent, in the region.、Um, but even though we have you know these regional climate weeks, there's so much diversity within the region and in each kind of country, and within that the local context. You had said, you know, not everyone is impacted differently. So I would love to just quickly switch to just talking about the local and knowing, you know, I would love to know a little bit about each of your your homes. And what inspired you to actually get involved? Because it's a big, you know, there's the local engagement, there's passion, and then you, you're organizing now at a regional level. But ultimately, can you tell us about your home and and what what drove you to start getting involved in climate?、Um, and maybe I'll go to to Axel first. Okay. Well,、um, around that,、um, first I I grew up in an old town. In、where we have one of the biggest refineries in Latin America. My family comes from a large generation of oil workers, and of course, I'm the exception. <laughs>、uh, for example, my my grandfather、uh, was like an oil transport around maritime, and my father was a、uh, was in in the platforms and、uh, oil platform, for example, in in, in the middle of the ocean, you know, like exploring and. Getting up the the oil. My brother right now is working on gas transportation, but、um, you know, like, grow up in 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 all in an old city is like very difficult because everyone in my city normalized the the carbon, normalized emissions. And I remember I remember when I was a child,、um, the noise of the refinery.、Uh, It's like the you know the way that I wake up to the school, and every time that I you know like show show up or took a take a look on my window,、um, I I can see like three flames, three bigger flames, you know like burning on、um, all the gas. So I don't know.、Um, it's very difficult to to grow up like this because.、Um, You don't have like a voice in in a place in, in where everyone's works in a, in an oil industry, and、um, everyone depends on of an oil industry. But you can see if you if you come here, you you will see that we live in a in a to live in an old town is to live in a、uh, like a ghost town because everyone here、uh, doesn't have a real life. Everyone here is like. Like a condemnate to 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 work in that refinery and generation by generation by generation are working there and dying because of this. And everyone wants to work there. <laughs> I remember like one month ago,、uh, one guy from my city like crucified in the middle of the street because he was like、uh, reclaimed for a job inside the refinery. So this type of situation is very difficult to me, and that is the reason that inspired me to to combat this type of old cities. Right now, in my position,、um, I'm articulating the 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 climate the climate with the human health and the energy transition, because if we don't know what is behind the plug,、um, what is the our energy comes from, we never.、Uh, We will save energy because how, how you can save energy if you don't know the consequences of the use of, of the use of energy, you know? So I think like the eight percent of the of the、um, like electric network here in Mexico is is well depend from、uh, hydrocarbons and all.、Uh, 
business, you know? So Renault is one of the most, um, I don't know, like uh, challenge that we have, right? Because uh, we want to decarbonize uh, 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 an entire city and start uh, with this is very difficult because we have to, uh, you know, like connect the proofs and, and in, in try to connect, interconnect all the, the you know, like the symptoms of, of, of this, because uh, um, I don't know what is the word for right now, but I think it's like, like the symptoms, to, the symptoms to, of all the, the generation of the energy business, because um, right now we know that uh, most of the gases, emission gases comes from the energy industry. So this is like a very particular point that I'm working on now in the local. Yeah, I, that's um, an incredible story. And thanks for sharing your home because I feel like I could see it almost in my head as, <laughs> as you're describing it. And uh, just the, yeah, how, how your, your work now is so tied to your family's history as well. And like the, the lineage from which you come from as much as it is you know, to working to change it, but working to improve uh, the lives and making sure that people know the cost of our energy, which we, the social costs, right, as well as the environmental yeah. costs. Um, and that's definitely not spoken out about enough. Um, I don't know, as well, if you want to tell us a bit about your home and, and why you, you've gotten into this. Yes, so I come from, I live actually in Buenos Aires, which is the capital city of Argentina. It's the biggest city in the country. And that has a lot of good things tied to it, but it also has a lot of negative things. For instance, we are not connected at all with nature. We have so little parks and green areas in our city. We have one of the widest rivers. We're bordering one of the widest, the widest river in the world. And yet we, all our constructions are not facing it, are giving it the back. So we're not connected to our river at all. It's also one of the most polluted rivers in the world as well. So I think I, so I live in one of the biggest cities in the, in the continent and, and the biggest city in the country. And it's a constant dichotomy between all the good stuff that comes from a city where you're super connected, you're close to the Congress, to the parliament, uh, you're, you have everything near, you have all the good things that living in a big city has, but also all the negative things, uh, the pollution, the cars, the yeah. conflicts with transportation, with electricity provision, with green space, with clean air, with clean water, and so on. And I, I don't know why I got involved in this, really. It was, I, it was appalling from a very young age. I also lived two years in Santiago de Chile, which is the capital city of Chile, the country that's right next to us. And there's a feeling that lingered on me since I was little. I have asthma and it's a very polluted city with a lot of smog. So I remember feeling very, very bad when the smog was high. And it was incredible because I felt helpless. It was like, I really can't do anything about this. It's, this will just happen because of meteorological conditions. Smog will be more or less. And I will feel bad and I will have a hard time at school and I will, won't be able to do sports as I like to do and yeah. I have to medicate myself and so on. So I feel, I feel that still lingers with me and I won't say that that was one of the reasons that I got into environmental matters, but that feeling of helplessness, I don't want anyone else to live it. And I know my feeling is really small compared to the people living yeah. in very vulnerable places, very vulnerable communities coastal communities that face literally uh, being banished by the sea. So yes, I, I don't want people to feel that. And I really do hope that in, in the near future, we can live in a world where, where no one has to feel despair for the world they live in, the city they live in, the community they live in, and they can just choose to live happily wherever they see best. Yeah, and, and around some parks and maybe viewing yeah. the river, maybe it not being full. You know, like there's so much work to be to be done. Uh, and there's there's beauty in our homes. But I think what's nice, um, what I love to some degree is that our frustration and our feeling of like, this is not inadequate, this world can be better, this is not enough, um, 
is such a driving force. So we can love our city and we can also want the best for it and, uh, and see a better future. Um, but yeah, I want to hear from you, Nasha. Maybe you're in the same place. Yes, exactly. Um, now, right now I'm the countryside, but I lived and I grew up in Buenos Aires, which as I also say is a very beautiful city with a lot to offer, but, uh, also really big city, noisy, um, with all the problems of big cities, not connected with nature. That's the reason why my mom used to take us on weekends really out of the city to the nature, let's say outside 100 to 200 kilometers away, just to play um, with other kids, to climb some trees and to do that kind of wild stuff that children do. And I thought that the world was full of trees when I was a little girl, like uh, nature was the rule. And then I discovered as I grew up that actually was the exception, that most of our territories were um, like literally taken down or, or the wild nature for agriculture or other activities that are needed for us, for humans. But I discovered that the forest and all the things I dreamed about how the world was when I was a little girl, actually it was, it was not like that. And the second thing is that when I went to school, I, one, I, I remember this. I discovered that not all, all the kids from my city were going to school, that there were kids that they are on the streets. And that was shocking for me when I was a little girl because I thought that everyone had the opportunity to go to school and learn. So those uh, problems combined um, really shocked me. And I think when you have a voice, like you say, hey, this is, <laughs> this is something that is a problem. Mm -hmm. You have two choices, right? You turn off that voice and you go to Netflix or you jump into a, another thing or you listen to that voice and you first find other people that think like you and they, they don't know how but they want to do something. So like people from, from ASU or you or here, all the people that are part of our organizations, maybe we don't know how to do it. We don't have the answer, but we are sure that we want to be part of the solution. So I engage with people and those people, uh, like this is how you follow and just start your path. I decided to study environmental sciences and I fell in love with the climate change as a problem as a whole. Because I believe that if we solve climate change, many other problems, social or environmental, can, um, can be solved too. Because you have to take care of your food, your water use, your um, transportation, your education, justice, adaptation, taking care of the most vulnerable. So it's a problem that really can um, scope all the other social and environmental problems we have today. So that is the reason why I engaged uh, on climate change. Thank you for pointing out how it's all connected. And even today, hearing our stories, this like, yeah, the education, pers human health, the energy. Um, I, I am excited to see that as we develop, right, as young people, as we see more problems in the world and as we figure out how, piece by piece, bit by bit, um, that we keep that in mind, right? Like that we, we man manage to keep the interconnected perspective um i don't want to close this conversation but i am acknowledging that we've taken 45 minutes and i'll save this live so that people who are just joining now can go back and watch the whole thing um, um and i just want to yeah thank you all for taking the time um i know it's a busy week i know you're all doing a lot um so thank you not only for being here but for also doing what you're doing and continuing this work i know there's so much work to be done um, there's always a space here for connect, you know, for what you're doing. And I think connect for climate is going to continue to, to showcase so many of, um, the, the, the successes that you go through as we go throughout the year, as we move to COP26. Um, and we're also, you know, we have our youth takeover this week where, uh, young people from the region are taking over our Instagram and our Twitter. Um, so this conversation is not over at all. Um, for everyone who's been watching and is curious how to join, I think, you know to follow the regional Koi uh, Instagram account, which I think Nasha is joining from. But in any case, join them all so you stay involved. Um, and yeah, good luck celebrating, good luck learning, um, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us.
Anytime. Thank you so much for everyone. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye.